So, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. All right, hair loss switchers. Today, we're going to talk about the most overrated hair loss treatment ever, microneedling. If you Chooms have ever watched any of my videos on microneedling, then you know I am not a big fan of it. People make unsubstantiated claims about its efficacy all the goddamn time, and there are many potential long-term risks involved with microneedling. The truth is, microneedling is an ineffective and dangerous hair loss treatment. It's no surprise that the people who hype up microneedling devices the most are doing so because they're selling one themselves. Microneedling is also very popular with finasteride haters and conspiracy theorists. Since they're terrified of finasteride, they'll fool themselves into believing that using microneedling is their ticket out of having to use a 5-air inhibiting drug. They've seriously deluded themselves into thinking that they could stop hair loss without inhibiting DHT if they just poke a bunch of holes in their scalp a few times per week. But the truth is, is that microneedling is nothing but pure cope. The only actual proven benefit microneedling has is as an adjunctive therapy when it is used alongside topical minoxidil since microneedling pokes a bunch of holes into your scalp which makes it easier for the minoxidil to reach your hair follicles. Microneedling when used alone has no proven benefit whatsoever. Of course, there are only a few studies looking at microneedling alone and microneedling proponents will often criticize these studies by invoking the no true Scotsman fallacy. This fallacy is also known as an appeal to purity fallacy. Whenever they see a microneedling study that doesn't tell them what they want to here, they'll say that the studies didn't use the right kind of microneedling device, or they used the wrong frequency, or they'll say that the duration of the study was wrong, or that the number of sessions was wrong, or that the needles were either too short or too long, or whatever other excuse you could possibly imagine. You chums get the idea. But since microneedling is not standardized in any way, it's very easy to make these fallacious arguments. And sure, maybe you could make the case that better research is needed. However, the burden of proof is on microneedling proponents to prove that it works, and they haven't met that burden not by a long shot. That's especially important because microneedling has many potential risks too, and I went over all that in earlier videos, so I'll go ahead and link my microneedling playlist below if you want to learn more about that. But as I said earlier, the only benefit microneedling actually has is to enhance the effects of topical minoxidil, and even with that benefit kept in mind, it still isn't worth it. Not just because microneedling has many risks, but also because the very same benefits from microneedling can be had by combining minoxidil with tretinoin, which is clinically proven to up regulate the sulfotransferase enzyme, which helps make minoxidil more effective. So, tretinoin gives the same benefits as microneedling without any of the pain or the risk. If you don't have access to tretinoin, you can also try using 10 or 15% topical minoxidil, which has been shown to be effective in people who are poor responders to 5% minoxidil, and I made a video about that, which I'll link below, in addition to my tretinoin video. But the purpose of this video isn't to revisit the risk of microneedling. I mean, I've already covered that in many videos already, but instead, what I want to do is I want to talk about a new risk, and that is the fact that microneedling can ruin your chances of having a good hair transplant. Whether or not microneedling will affect a future hair transplant is a question that frequently comes up on the hair loss forums, but up until now, it seems people have not been able to get a clear answer on it. So, to answer this question, let's first look at what kind of scalp is ideal for a hair transplant, and then we'll look at how microneedling could affect your scalp in order to make it less suitable for a transplant. If you look at the websites of prominent hair transplant surgical centers, you can see several factors factors in the scalp that make the transplant procedure more likely to succeed. One of those factors is the looseness and flexibility of the scalp. Having a loose and flexible scalp is ideal for getting a hair transplant. So that means that the worst situation for getting a hair transplant is having scar tissue in the recipient region. A hair transplant can still be done under those circumstances, but it is much more technically challenging for the doctor and it may not work out in the patient's favor. So to better understand this, I first need to explain what microneedling does to the skin. First of all, we need to keep in mind that microneedling was originally developed to treat scar tissue. Its greatest success is in treating acne scars. Some people have a really good response, while in other people, the response is much more mediocre. However, what's especially important to remember here when it comes to treating acne scars is that we're usually talking about a very short-term duration treatment with microneedling. Usually, it's limited to just three months. With microneedling for androgenic alopecia, on the other hand, we could be talking about a lifetime of treatment. And instead of microneedling scar tissue, you are microneedling healthy skin in the scalp, which is a big difference. There isn't much long-term data on microneedling, but the longest follow-up data I could find in any study of microneedling was this study here. It is a study of just 20 patients 
patients with androgenic alopecia who were followed for two years, and the subjects received microneedling along with a concoction called concentrated growth factor. The next longest study is this one here. It has a follow-up of just one year and is a study of 120 subjects treated for acne scars with microneedling. And I'm sorry to say it, chumps, but that's all the long-term data we have on microneedling. There are no five-year studies or 10-year studies like there are with finasteride or dutasteride. So clearly, the long-term data is very limited when it comes to microneedling, particularly when we're looking at subjects with androgenic alopecia treated with microneedling as opposed to microneedling for treating scar tissue. That's important because like I said, microneedling of scar tissue may not be the same as microneedling of healthy skin. The reason microneedling helps treat acne scars and other type of scar tissue is not by eliminating scar tissue or breaking up fibrosis. Microneedling actually adds collagen to the skin to smooth out scar tissue. Remember that collagen is what is created by fibroblast cells to create scar tissue in the first place. So when we suffer a cut on our skin, for instance, the first step in the healing process of the damaged tissue is that a blood clot will form to stop the bleeding. After that, inflammation occurs, which causes fibrocytes to come to the wound where they produce collagen. The collagen has the ability to cross-link with other collagen fibers and a firm and strong scar eventually forms. But the collagen fibers are very irregular, which is unlike young normal skin where the collagen fibers are more in parallel. So microneedling doesn't work by eliminating the collagen of the scar tissue. That's not possible. What it does, it just adds more collagen in a more regular pattern. So it sort of fills in the gaps of the scar tissue with more collagen. We know this from some of the earliest studies on microneedling, specifically this study here from 2005. In fact, this was before microneedling was even called microneedling. It was actually originally called percutaneous collagen induction. So clearly, just from the original name alone, you could tell from the very beginning that this was a tool to add and not subtract collagen from the skin. So even if it wasn't called microneedling back then, that's definitely what it is. Although you can see the microneedling technique used back then was pretty rough and painful looking. So in this article, skin biopsies were done before microneedling and six months after microneedling. The biopsy showed an incredible increase in the amount of collagen in the skin. This figure shows an amazing 400% increase in collagen and a last in six months after treatment. The end result of all this collagen production was the skin got tighter. So the authors of the study proposed several indications for this percutaneous collagen induction, which is actually microneedling. These indications include treating wrinkles or stretch marks because the procedure tightens the skin, as well as treating acne scars because it thickens the skin. This effect on collagen and skin thickening has been confirmed in other studies, like this study done on rats. However, the effect on elastin is not so clear. Elastin is the protein that gives the skin elasticity. So if you lose elastin, your skin becomes less elastic, so it gets less flexible. The study I just went over showed an increase in elastin with microneedling, but some studies showed a decrease in elastin, so it's kind of a mixed message there. In this study of microneedling for acne scars, for instance, collagen increased with microneedling, however, elastin actually decreased. This increase in new collagen and destruction of elastin was also seen in another study of microneedling for hair loss. So microneedling increased collagen production, which caused thickening and tightening of the skin, but it also could reduce the elasticity of the skin by destroying elastin. So. Do you choose to remember what I said earlier about the ideal scalp for hair transplant according to hair transplant surgeons? Well, remember, it's a loose and flexible scalp, but microneedling can give you a tighter, thicker, and stiffer scalp. So it's no wonder that microneedling has become an anathema to so many hair transplant surgeons. Now, I'm not saying that microneedling will make hair transplants impossible. However, when you have a hair transplant, you are paying a dollar amount for every single hair follicle that is transplanted, sometimes about $10 per graft. When you're spending that kind of money, you want to have as many of these transplants transplanted follicles to take hold and grow successfully as you possibly can. I think anything that decreases the possibility of success is a huge, huge problem. And I think there's enough evidence to say that microneedling can lower the chance of a successful procedure. This is why transplant surgeons don't want you microneedling before a transplant procedure. Most surgeons will say you need to stop it for at least a few months before the procedure. And since we already have alternatives to microneedling like tretinoin that don't have the same drawbacks as microneedling, you might as well drop the microneedling device altogether. So, there aren't any randomized controlled studies on the effects of preoperative microneedling on the outcomes of hair transplantation, but I think the weight of evidence strongly suggests that it's not a very good idea. It changes the characteristics of your scalp skin in a way that is not beneficial for a hair transplant, as well as putting you at risk for skin infections that can make a hair transplant even impossible. So, microneedling is laughably overhyped. It's dangerous, and there are far superior alternatives out there, like using tretinoin or stronger concentrations of topical monoxidil. There is 
no reason why anyone needs to use microneedling and whatever benefits it may have, they are far outweighed by the risk, especially since we now know it can mess up hair transplants. So some of you may be bummed out by hearing this, but the truth is, is that this is actually good news. It's good news because it means nobody needs to mutilate their scalp anymore and they can throw their microneedling device in the trash can where it belongs along with rosemary oil, castor oil, broccoli, and Rob England's scalp massages. All right, chums, that's it for now. I'll be back with some more content in the very near future, but I hope you all enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. God bless.